All right, hi everyone. I'm here to talk to you about the Anthropocene um, for our unit in medical anthropology. Um, so first of all, what is the Anthropocene? This is probably a term that you've heard more people using um, in the last couple of years. It's sort of come into popularity. And it's basically like if you see this graph here, they've got all the different scenes, the different eras or epochs in the history of the earth and what, what was occurring then. Um, the humans don't appear until quite late in that, in that um, chart there. But the Anthropocene is a new term people are using to sort of describe the geological age where human adaptive strategies have had the most impact and negative impact mostly on the environment characterized by mass extinction, rising sea levels, a warming climate, and polluted natural resources. And as your um, Rutledge Handbook says, largely as a result of our present highly wasteful, environmentally threatening mode of production. Um, one of the links that I've got you listening to this week is a six minute um, NPR story talking about what the Anthropocene is. So you'll have a listen to that. Um, if or maybe you've already listened to it, or after you listen to this, that's linked on Canvas. So what does anthropology have to contribute to the Anthropocene? Well, obviously, you know me, and you know I'm going to think that uh, anthropological inquiry is going to have a lot to contribute to the Anthropocene. In fact, um, one, of the, one of the anthropologists who used to work at St. Ben St. John's, um, who was here when I first came, Jessie O'Reilly, she does research on Antarctic and on the process of scientific knowledge production around climate science. So her research takes place at climate conferences, which is really interesting. I'm going to turn this light off. I think it's making a weird shine. There we go. Um, so one of the things that anthropology and the Anthropocene can um, inform us about is looking at early depictions of people living in nature. Um, and this kind of draws attention to the possibilities for human environmental interactions and the ways that that humans can in, engage with the environment in a sustainable way that only works, obviously, with smaller populations of humans. Um, it also draws attention to lost indigenous knowledge that's either already lost or being being lost and how rapidly that occurs. I've, I've got a clip um, for you to watch about the Kung, which is uh, now I believe they're called the Zhu Huanxi, um, but a group of people living in kind of Botswana area. And they were very um, good at living in their environment. You're welcome to watch the whole film, um, but I've only got you watching about 10 minutes of it or so. But it kind of describes all the ways that they feed themselves throughout the seasons. And then they were forced by colonial governments to kind of basically live on something similar to native reservations, but for people in Botswana. And a lot of that knowledge got lost. People got very unhealthy. Um, so there's a lot. And, and that happened so rapidly. And those the, the descendants of those people had been living in that same environment for t maybe 20,000 years. So for 20,000 years, that knowledge was preserved. And then all of a sudden, it's lost. Um, anthropology can also help to understand the health impacts of the Anthropocene on humans and the different um, readings for today really highlight that environmental um, pollution that causes allergies or that causes other problems about humans' relationships in the environment, um, people living in volatile areas like New Orleans, uh, and of course there's tons and tons of examples like the Marshall Islands or any of these other things where we see the impacts of, of human activity on human health. It can also help to understand the deep under, um, to help to deepen the understanding of the relationship between humans and their environment. I think the newer um, bit on the native community in Canada does this really nicely. Also helps to investigate the ways people and cultures adapt to environmental changes. So if you're an anthropologist, you could study how people living on Marshall Island would adapt to the rising sea levels or how people in the Arctic are are adapting to um, the permafrost melting and that sort of thing. And then it also allows us to turn a critical lens toward understanding responses and political economic failures to environmental challenges. The Katrina example is kind of the most, and actually the one about um, the one about oil, the oil production. Um, that one, th those really kind of help you understand the political economic failures to environmental challenges and 
partly in how risk is construed, and we'll talk about that in a bit, um, and how people perceive what's going on around them based on the political context. Because if we could sort of strip away politics, people would probably recognize the, the environmental challenges that we're facing. And then you can also investigate human rights abuses caused by the environment. Um, so I have you watching a clip of Nye, the story of a Kung woman. Um, and I put the clip up there on Canvas. I believe it should work. And I've specified which minutes I want you to watch because you don't have to watch the whole thing. I love this film. I think it's amazing. I remember it as an undergrad. So if you have an extra hour to spare, I would say watch the whole thing. But I especially want you to watch these 10 minutes so you can kind of see these early ethnographic depictions. And then I have a few questions that um, I'm going to post on the um, on the Canvas page midway through the week and also that we can talk about in our Zoom meeting on Thursday, but what value does some of this footage from many years ago have of people living as foragers, as hunter-gatherers? What are the potential pitfalls or misuses of this kind of footage, um, and how could this influence our current practices? And then if you could connect this clip to the, the Noor Johnson's case study of Inuit health in a changing Arctic, I think there's some really interesting connections there, even though they're in like, as far away on the earth as, as could possibly be. One's at the pole and one's near the equator. Um, so these are some of the questions to, to think about while watching the clip or the whole film if you get a chance. The end of the film sort of shows what happens after they're moved into this reservation type thing. The footage covers about 20 to over 20 or 30 years and it's really interesting to see how this woman's life, or no, maybe even more than that, maybe 50 or 60 years. Um, so if you got some time, I highly recommend. All right, so one of the other interesting things that this chapter draws out is the different ways that cultures construct risk. You sort of think that risk is a like it either is or it isn't. Either something is inherently risky or it's not. But in fact, like everything else, <laughs> it's going to be familiar to many of you, risk is culturally construed or constructed. So first of all, how people perceive something to be dangerous is is a, a cultural construction. So if you are very concerned about climate change, for example, and like what kind of future your children might have, then things seem quite risky to you. And, and that's something that make you nervous. But if you don't believe the science around climate change, which is largely a political belief, not a scientific one, not largely, completely a political belief, not a scientific one, but I also think kind of a human one in the sense of it's so big, climate change, that our puny little brains have a really hard time understanding that this could be, you know, the beginning of the end kind of thing. Um, so I think people grab onto something that might tell them that it's not true because it's too scary. So it's partly political. And I also think it's partly like the limitations of the human uh, mind and our ability to really understand space and time. But people's perceptions are dang of danger are constructed by cultural beliefs, which are also, of course, entangled with politics. Um, the second way is that technology is used to detect and make visible what is dangerous is culturally constructed or or structurally constructed, I guess, limited by by a structural inability, um, structural inequalities, excuse me. So for example, like clean water is a good example. If we, um, you know, we d determine that in Flint, Michigan, there was unclean water, which led to deaths and disability for a lot of kids um, because of high levels of lead. There are lots of places in India that have very high levels of lead, but it's not tested. It goes undetected. And so people die or get these disabilities. And it, and but the cause of it is not made visible. Um, and then the third way is that socio-political systems that set up rules about how to respond to such risks. So we say um, you know, in the context of climate change, we say, here's some, you know, here's some carbon taxes that we might put into place to manage or to respond that risk. We know that the, the solutions, not just the U.S. government, but all over the world are putting into place are not aggressive enough to actually deal with the problem. But it's a start, but it's but it's also, you know, we think that of that as like, here's the response to this risk. But, um, you know, the coronavirus is a good example, too, because this is one of the first times that the risk has been made um, to seem and, and and largely is a product of the environment, human interactions, too, probably because we're, you know, encroaching on 
the space where animals have to live and therefore coming into closer contact with them by deforestation and that sort of thing. Um, the answers around that aren't completely clear yet, but, but, um, but in terms of coronavirus, people have perceived it to be very risky and so have taken drastic measures and responded in a certain way and people have different um, a, a beliefs about, about if that's the correct thing to do. And so later in the, in the week, we'll, we'll talk about um, how do risks and responses to um, these rules and sociopolitical systems differ based on the context and culture. Can you think of any examples? This is one that I particularly want to know. Can you think of any examples of something you think is a risk and all other cultures don't or vice versa? Um, and this connected with the environment or anything, an example that off the top of my head that, that I think of is that, you know, when pregnant women here are asked not to eat soft cheeses, for example, unpasteurized cheeses, um, and not to drink alcohol, whereas in France, it, it's expected that someone will have a glass of wine with their meal, even if they're pregnant, but they're told not to eat lettuce because it could be a high carrier of listeria, so a bacteria that can harm the fetus. Um, but what's the difference between these these two ideas about um, what's why things are considered risky or not? And then what role does technology play in these different ideas about risk? And we'll talk a little bit about those later in the week.